Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. I'm really happy to have you here with me on this gorgeous autumn day and here with me for my last harvest in our garden in our zone 3B. We have had several hard frosts and even ice forming on the top of some of our stock tanks over the last couple of days. Hi Maple. Maple is extremely dirty because it rained all night long. Look at this dirty dog. And you also smell a little bit like a skunk. Hmm? Did you chase a skunk off in the night? We always get quite a few skunks in this time of year. They're trying to get all fat for winter and they want to steal eggs from my chicken coops, but my Great Pyrenees do a really good job of keeping them back. But it always means that our farm smells slightly of skunk for a couple of months this time of year. But that's okay, because you're doing your job, right? Now we'll need to go track down my wagon, my shovel, and my pitchfork and go and get all of those veggies taken out of the garden. This is what ground cherries look like. And as you can see, they are super, super prolific. You don't want to pick ground cherries, from what I understand, until they have fallen off onto the ground and their husks are dried out like this. So these ones are just perfect. Let's open one up here. Let's see if I can do it one-handed with gloves on. No, I cannot. One sec. Okay, let's see here. They look like this and they taste sour. These actually taste sour, which is way better than this kind of sickly sweet flavor that they had earlier in the season. So I'm gonna get all of these picked and there are a lot of them. And then we'll bring them inside, take the husks off and turn them into something yummy. I'm assuming you can probably make some jelly, some preserve of some kind out of these. There, let's just make this easy and pull this plant right out of the ground. I don't wanna get dirt all over these though. I can see um, why people say that these self seed everywhere and you end up with tons more the following year after you've planted them because they are everywhere and they are very prolific. One of the things that I find in my garden um, is that a lot of plants that people find invasive in other climates are not invasive here. Catnip would be an example of that. Mint would be another example of that. Um, and I'm hoping that these are the same where I don't end up with, you know, a hundred ground cherries popping up in this location next year. I'm really impressed with these as far as the amount of fruit they produced because when I um, planted them, I started them from seed in my greenhouse, they just didn't do super well. And they didn't do super well until the heat hit of the summer. And then they just went crazy. But if I can grow them here, you can probably grow them wherever you are. Oh, the sun has come out and it's so beautiful. It was raining when I came out earlier. How's it going, Jack? I've talked to you before about cabbages and how you can actually cut the head off of a cabbage the same as you can cut your main head off broccoli and you will get little tiny side baby cabbages. So I wanted to show you what happened with a few of them that I left in the garden so that I could show you what they look like. They're not a full huge head of cabbage just like broccoli. Side shoots on broccoli aren't the same size as the regular head, but um, they're not bad. But so this is one, I cut the main one off and we have one two, three little heads. And these are really good for stir fry. You can even blanch them and freeze them. So that makes me pretty happy. But this is the cabbage that I am here for today. The Deaden cabbage. That is just, has to be one of the most beautiful cabbages. Thank you, Jack. So we will cut this off. Do you wanna hold the camera for me? Okay. Just look at that. Isn't that just beautiful? So these deaden cabbages are a late season cabbage and I wasn't sure that they were going to head up, but they did. I didn't think they'd have enough time, but we have had a bit of an extended warm autumn. I will try them again next year though, because they're just lovely. 
so beautiful. So as you can see now, it's all green on the inside. There are a couple of different ways that you can harvest and store your cabbage. You can do it like this, where you just cut them off on the bottom and store them that way. Or you can do it like this, and that's where you leave the root ball on. And you can actually hang your cabbage or have it resting on a shelf like this. And I've had great luck with doing them this way, but I don't have a ton of cabbages for storage this year, so we'll probably eat them up in the next six to eight weeks or so. So I am just gonna have them cut off. It's cleaner and I don't have so much dirt in my storage if I do it that way. I did have some um, issues, like I talked about earlier in the summer, with cabbage moths. As you can see, they've done a little munching here. So anything like that, I'm going to bring inside and we'll use that up right away or I'll make sauerkraut with them. These are definitely not huge cabbages like I'll show you in a second, like my red acre cabbages, but they're still quite lovely. Yeah, these have quite a few eggs in them all dead now, <laughs> but that's going to need a little rinse. Look at that beauty. Gorgeous. So this one is a red acre cabbage and these ones actually store really well. Jack, would you mind grabbing that for me? Thank you. It's heavy. You'll need both hands. We have already harvested the brunt of our cabbage harvest and have converted most of that into sauerkraut. So these ones will be for winter storage. And I have about 10, 15 or so, um, which is pretty good. I'm happy with that. Some of my children cannot stand the bitterness of leafy greens, or in this case, leafy purples um, at all, but they don't even notice it if I add it in, if it's in a powdered form into soup or stew or smoothies or anything like that. So I am going to try to get a quart jar, I mean, uh, not a quart jar, a gallon jar of these for winter. And I'm late at doing this, but the nice thing is, is that kale is actually very frost hardy. So you can get away with harvesting it late like this without a risk to it. You can actually harvest kale. Yes, honey. Oh, that's okay you can harvest kale right into hard freezes and it's still pretty good. Okay, hmm, how should we do this? You know what, Jack? Let's take all of the um, cabbages down to the root cellar and then we'll have room in the wagon to put all of the kale and bring it up to the house. It is such a good feeling this time of year when the root cellar is full and the pantry's full. I will be doing a pantry tour here probably in the next couple of weeks and show you all of the food that I put up over the summer. I love my root cellar so much. All righty, let's put the rock in the door. What about if we put this bin of carrots over there? Is there room? Yeah. Because you could put some even up on this ledge. Then over here. And now we'll grab these cabbages, bud, and we'll bring them in. And these big purple ones we'll bring in and make sauerkraut with. One of the issues that I've been having down here is it's been so warm outside that it has been too warm in here. Um, nothing is going soft yet, but I'm worried that it might. So I've been leaving this door, um, the inner door, open and then closing the outer door here. We're not getting down to really cold temperatures yet. It's, you know, minus two, minus three in that range, which is totally fine for this walkway, the breezeway here to give it enough of a buffer between that and the produce that's in here. But I probably will only risk doing that for a couple more days before I will close this inner door. But I'm feeling good about that. I don't think our root cellar has ever been um, this full before. <laughs> that's really exciting. I made a little bit of a foo paw in my garden. I planted parsnips along here last year 
and they only got about this big. I haven't had great luck with getting really big parsnips, so I decided to leave them in the ground. I thought, oh, I'll just deal with them in the spring. And then, of course, spring came, and I didn't deal with them. And then every single one of them went to seed. So now I have about a bajillion seeds here. So I'm probably going to have parsnips coming up in this area for many years to come. <laughs> but anyone need parsnip seeds? You can come pick parsnip seeds because I have basically an endless supply now. All right, now let's get the abundance kale picked. I did get all of the abundance kale seeds brought up inside and I'll be checking germination on those in the next um, couple of days. Now let's fill that with some kale, shall we? I don't know if you guys can hear the saw sounds coming from up at the house, but very exciting thing is going on up at the house and I'm hoping to be able to share the whole entire thing with you in the next week or so, but we did get a wood cook stove. So excited and so grateful. This is something that I have been wanting for a very long time. I have had a wood cook stove in two of our previous homes and I absolutely loved it so much. And I've been longing for one ever since we bought this place. So we finally got one. Dan is installing the chimney in there and he actually just put a wood stove into his shop as well and got that um, chimney done and then we have the inspectors coming for insurance and all of that uh, to say i'm someone who um, doesn't love cooking would probably be an understatement <laughs> i do it because it's a it's a big part of our life here having a large family of course um, and i can cook and i'm an okay cook but i wouldn't say i am um, the most creative cook in the world everything is pretty simple around here but cooking on a wood cook stove for some reason and I'm not really sure why I don't know more purposeful in some kind of weird way I don't know but I'm looking forward to early mornings lighting the cook stove and having a cup of tea with the sound of it crackling plus it's going to be very nice because we have a wood furnace um, that we use for heat an indoor wood furnace but there are sort of areas of our house like like there is with most um, wood heated houses that are kind of cool spots. And we put our cook stove in a spot that um, it, was, it should make a big difference with that, just to just warm up the house a little bit more thoroughly, especially when we get down to minus 20 and minus 30 degrees. This is going to take me a few days, I think, to get through. I have two dehydrators and um, and I think I almost have enough there to fill both of them right now. Yep, I think that is about all I can do. Okay, do you know what I'm gonna do? I think I'm going to take you up to the house and just give you a sneak peek of the wood cook stove because it's so beautiful and I'm so excited about it. And I know there's lots of you that probably will be excited about it with. So let's go up to the house and do that. And um, I'll see if I can bring you guys and this wagon full of kale at the same time. How's it going, hon? <laughs> That's awesome. Here she is. This is now Myra Oval. And I absolutely love it. It's so beautiful. And Dan has the chimney going in, starting to go in. It has to go up through a bedroom and then out the roof there so it's quite the project but I could not be more excited about this so this is my kitchen here and it sits here which is a little bit of a way away from the kitchen but that's fine because it is going to warm this area up as well as this area so that's really exciting Okay guys, that is it for me today. I hope that you all have a fantastic day and I'll see you again next time. Bye. Do you need some help up there? <laughs>